Surfing Mountain by Michael Collier, Hysterical Water by Hannah Baker Saltmuch, and The Newest Employee of the Museum of Ruin by Charlie Clark. As you're joining us today online, you'll see that you have the options to enter questions in our Q&A feature. Please try to keep, um, keep engaged with our readers, but we will answer your questions at the end of our event. Our apologies in advance if we can't get to every question. Before we begin, I do want to thank everyone for joining us online as we continue to expand our events on a virtual platform. All right, I'll begin by introducing our three panelists. Michael is the author of eight collections of poems, including an individual history, a finalist for the Poets' Prize, and for the National Book Critics Circle and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. He is Emeritus Professor of English at the University of Maryland and Emeritus Director of Mid Middlebury Breadloaf Cited Conferences. He has received numerous honors, including a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation, an award in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and was Poet Laureate of the State of Maryland from 2001 to 2004. He currently lives in Vermont. His most recent collection is The Missing Mountain, New and Selected Poems. Hannah Baker Saltmarsh is the author of poetry collections, Hysterical Waters, and a book of literary criticism, Male Poets and the, and the Agon of the Mother, Context and Confessional, and Post-Confessional Poetry. She has published essays and poems in feminist studies, the Kennedy, Mary Trinity, the Real Review, and other. She lives with her husband and three children in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and teaches at Mount Murphy University. Charlie Clark studied poetry at the University of Maryland. His work has appeared in the New England Review, Cleotes, Plowshare, Smartish Case, Three Penny Review, West Branch, and other journals. A 2019 NEA Fellow and recipient of scholarship to the Breadloaf Writers Conference, he is the author of the newest employee of the Museum of Ruin. He lives in Austin, Texas. Charlie will be starting with you. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's really, it's really wonderful to be doing this. Um, thank you to Politics and Prose for hosting this and to Michael and Hannah for including me in this again. Um, it's just really a pleasure to be doing this with, with both of you. Um, I, I, I'm in my, my parents' home in the suburbs of DC, um, actually surprisingly not far from I think where Hannah uh, uh, grew up also. And I, as I sat down to get ready to do this, I saw this picture, I'm just gonna show you really quickly, right next to where I sat down. And I wasn't gonna read it, but this, the, this, the story behind this picture figures in one of the poems in the book. And right when I sat down, I thought, okay, well, geez, I guess I gotta read this. So I'm gonna start with, uh, with this poem. Um, my last conversation with Mary Jane Bailey, Bailey was about the taste of buckshot in baked swan. I wanted to remember more, but couldn't. Someone suggested bloodletting. Someone else suggested several hours of ghost talk. I suggested nothing. Picture this. Picture her with a rifle posed beside a Buick. Picture her taking someone's stray blast in the chest while quail hunting in 1942. Picture how she dressed her wounds and drove herself over hours of knocking Idaho back roads to the nearest doctor's house. There was a war on, after all, though when isn't there a war on? Every act amounted to a sacrifice. Tell me, Mary, which of my actions counts as preparation for life during wartime? Yes, the inconsistent stretches and push-ups. Yes, the quiet watching in the night. No, the amount of toilet paper I use each week. No, all my fawning over music. Not even napalm death, machine gun etiquette, or life during wartime. No, the writing of poems. When Creeley called Coke lightweight, or rather when I came across this while reading someone's gloss on the poetry wars, it sounded like Creeley believed his poems could chop wood, start fires, and inflict wounds. In poetry, the goal is always to inflict wounds. So say the vagaries of some strange muse. I do terrible things and claim I'm only following orders. Picture these stanzas 
leavened with dead elephants. Picture the madman setting fire to the tree. Picture yourself. Picture this misfortune to be alive in words only other than your own. Um, <laughs> my, my father pointed out when I was looking at that picture with him that I, it's actually a shotgun and not a rifle in the picture that she's holding and that I got it wrong in the poem, but it shows how little I know about weaponry. Um, okay. So the next poem um, I'm going to read, this is something uh, Hannah had actually mentioned this poem to me yesterday. So I'm, I'm reading it. Uh, I, I hope you enjoy it as much as you did when you read it to yourself. <laughs> it's called Mr. Dreamy. Now, when I see a night that's weak with clouds, it makes me nervous. All those rings wrenched around the moon. There are rhymes I don't remember that say whatever it is, such a rising sky, such a sky is rising supposedly portends. Whatever it is, I feel it. Sometimes I wish the night were unnecessary. Most nights that I feel that way, I feel the same about day come daybreak. See the sun bleeding through the trees? Not being a sailor doesn't make you any safer from it. I used to think being left-handed meant I was more likely to die in a car wreck. Turns out the biggest risk is living. There's a grimness to that thought, something shallow and permanent. When I want to be better than that, I give myself one of Whitman's catalogs to chew on. It doesn't last, that first capacious bubble of patience. However well he may have wandered and adored it, Whitman knew the world is a livid veil of dust and also that it's insane with blood and he never even wept in West Virginia. When snow surprised everyone in late April in New Jersey, 1890, did Whitman's neighbors roll their eyes at all of his raw praise? Even if they weren't farmers, they likely knew what damage spring snows can do. Did he? One book I'm reading makes the claim that Whitman disliked farming with some passion. In my one year as a farmhand, I laid fire pots between orchard lines whenever it would snow. Everything about those hours, the limbs frigid fractal beauty, briefly outgrowing my discomfort with the open, I detested and desire. Even snipping shops, snip, ooh, even sipping schnapps between the rows, how the darkness gave everything the gauzy aquatic depth of the impersonal and alluring. Going through, setting down the burning bowls, I was as slow about that as I was about everything. My boss called me Mr. Dreamy and meant it as an insult. I haven't gotten over it so much as tried to sculpt my life such that my being dreamy isn't gonna cost anybody's bottom line. One harvest day that year, I forgot which way the road knifed and flipped the truck and walked away. When the ambulance arrived, I smiled and tried to wave it by. When my boss arrived, he threw a wrench at me. It was dark by then. I'd been sitting there for hours. The sky was clear. The moon blew through it. The road below was lit bright with our tremendous apples. My whole life, I have wondered what's become of me. All right. Um... So like I said, I'm in, you know, I'm in Montgomery County right now, um, and, but I live in Austin and it's the first time since the start of the pandemic that I've been away from my family um, and I miss my wife and daughter very much. And so this is maybe not like the, the most heartwarming of, of poems, but I'm reading it for my daughter. <laughs> it's called the, the Gypsies Singing Goodbye to Their Child. When we stole you, we also took the kitchen's largest pot and three round loaves of bread. The pot you slept in sometimes. The loaves became your favorite toys. One you tore in half and used as a coconut to recount for us Monty Python's holy grail. But we read the papers. We're not such fools. That's why we've put you in this park. Your front tooth we pulled so we'd at least have something. It's the only hurt we hope will never heal. 
we take turns sucking it at night. Each time it grows smaller, less distinctly bone. I don't know what we'll do when it's all gone. All right. Um, so I'm gonna read three more poems that are all part of like a length thing that happens throughout the book. Um, it's called uh, the words in a love poem all mean the same thing, but each poem in the book, I slightly reconfigured the title. Um, and each one of them, they're like in two short parts. Um, so this one is called the words in the same poem all mean the love thing. Summertime is a castle of long white grass. Anything can make me think of you. Squares of sunlight burning on my chest. Hoarders marathons closed captioned at the gym. At night, when I'm counting the books that I can bear to part with, something I do under the auspices of cleaning house, nothing ever actually leaves the shelves. Words are made to accumulate, like plaque in one's ventricles. Even the idiot who runs my heart knows this. Solitary man, he won't say it, but he lives for your company, and the hope is that he dies of it. Cut me some slack. I don't have a death wish, however much I may circle back to it as a subject. As a subject, it's tied with love, painters, replacement songs, and the garbage I see when biking. Life is full of candy wrappers bleached white under the sun. I still mistake half of them for butterflies drunk in gutters. English is the only means I have to show this. So Caravaggio in hell must not be too jealous. He had oils in Italy. Light, therefore, let him render the unspeakable. Almost every morning, I stare directly at the sun. Reeling, I go blind beneath its radiance, kicking each pale letter of the world in place. All right, and this, um, this iteration of it is called The Loves in a Word Poem All Mean the Same Thing. Consider this an admission of deficiencies, how I can't identify a single tree. After three drinks, they all look like live oaks growing. Reading John Donne is even worse. Less analysis than a bloodletting ensues. I used to think I could make a name for myself this way, exploring wounds like the lousy bites of love. Consider this an admission of intimacies laid out against advice from counsel. Ah, what a trifle is the heart. Rocking in the chest, in the cradle of my chest, K-hold, recounting each blemish it's bestowed. Should I start explaining myself? Appropriation seemed necessary at the moment. Sometimes one must veer wherever one is veering. Here's a different admission. At 16, in a, on a Chevron station's bathroom wall, I scribbled soaring Kierkegaard quotations as though they were my own. Under no circumstance would I say that I've matured. Now, what was that but a veiled appeal for love? Winters then were a sleepy purple hell, except for a few clear views of constellations. Should the future build a time machine, I would take it only here and now, to this, our very strand of days. Okay, and so this is the last poem um, in that series, and the last poem in the book, and the last poem that I'm going to read. So thank you again to Politics and Prose, and Hannah and Michael, it's been just a real pleasure doing this. Um, you know, I, I came to, I've been loving Politics and Prose for literally decades, uh, and reading as a part of it is kind of unfathomable to me. So it, it's, it's really a pleasure. Okay, so this is uh, the last poem. It's called, The Things in a Poem All Mean the Same Word Love. Sometimes I wish I could write a poem that only you would read and that John Q. Public would catch wind of this intimacy somehow and somehow they would reward it handsomely enough that I could go on doing nothing but writing poems addressed to and seen only by you, but sung of by others with such veneration 
that successive classes of undergraduates would write embarrassingly earnest research papers, enumerating their hopes for what said poems contain without their ever actually wanting to see the poems themselves. Even TMZ would get in on the act, shooing its cameras elsewhere. Oh, that is what I want, to make you what the world adores through its unknowing. Constants are rare enough to cherish. Here, like the bread I burn each morning, I lay an offering out for you by hand. That my blood revels in this recurrence. That my blood lingers in its tunnels in the full belief that this is how blood stops time. Even my blood has theories. Constants are rare enough to cherish. Like constellations, they are mostly what you make of them. All the words in a love poem mean the same thing. Radiance stop here, here at the river of my blood. Kneeling, it drank and became the river. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to now hand it over to Hannah Baker Saltmarsh. Thank you, Charlie. That was great. The first poem I'm going to read concerns an insular, repressive spiritual community that I'm still afraid of reading about in my parents' house. <laughs> um, and it's kind of about different ways of leaving or being exiled from those types of spaces, but then also about a changing friendship that felt more like a disappearance. This girl I lost touch with. This girl who was afraid to enter a room. This girl conceived in the woods on moss whose family dreamt under quilts, who wore dresses that matched anything fabric in the house, even the dresses without loneliness. I held her hand in the corridor dark until the speaking in tongues at the community college dispersed into prayers with too many gerunds and too much fervor that wouldn't adjust if you got a thousand dollars in the mail or jury duty, faith subtle as a crucifix the size of God on a highway. I waited with her until it was over, although the prayer group was never really over. Over rooms of crowded, faith-based humidity, she loved corridors of woods, the rushes of running away. This girl and I, we were cult lured, but then the leader stepped down. Was it porn, alcohol, Vicodin? The first time I drove in a man's car, there weren't doors. I was 18, so I fell in love looking straight ahead together, arm hair touching, the cathedral of autumn anticipating a shape to hold you, the wind that you sometimes hollered over. What happened I can't see, but when he left the group I left, the death of visions. This girl longed for someone too in her fingernails and without talking just takes a man from his pregnant wife's side, has his even newer children, this girl, who wouldn't go in a room all alone, walked right in somewhere we've not been and never left. Um, a little bit of context for this next poem. Uh, lactivist is a lactation or breastfeeding rights activist. Um, and it comes out of having had three kids and breastfed all of them and having had awkward and uncomfortable situations in public spaces of people making comments. Um, it also kind of celebrates the joy of motherhood too, but, but there's also some rage. Okay, um, Lactivist Manifesto. One, to Alicia Ostriker, breastfeeding is better than ardor, which is a bitter honey anyway. Ostriker celebrates in her baby and herself the pleasure of touching and being touched by this most perfect thing, this pear blossom, a way of being together beyond all the other forms of innocence. Two, know your rights. A mother may breastfeed her baby or express breast milk in any location, public or private, where the mother is otherwise authorized to be. Furthermore, women seen in the act of breastfeeding will not be considered for, quote, indecent exposure, sexual conduct, lewd touching, or obscenity, end quote. Yet you will hear, I can't believe she's doing that in public. You might wanna make sure a woman sits next to you so it's not awkward for everybody. You can't do that in the sanctuary. Maybe try somewhere private. 
that's too sexual. Breasts are an arousing area. That's why I couldn't breastfeed. When are you going to wean her? In front of my husband? None of my babies liked the nursing cover, the flurry of a blanket, peeking with elbows, fists, the heat in the heat. Three, a lactivist is a surrealist. Jigsaw together, a reclining baby, a tipped nipple, the entanglement of hands, the stopping and starting, intermittent dreaming, sleeping, demanding, the spastic calm, the fringes of eyelashes like flapper bangs. Four, messages my breast pump has said to me always in all stresses. Right now, let's go, you're a star. Real quick, shut up, let it go, not now, let go, okay. Five, if my breasts were a building by Frank Lloyd Wright following Wright's manifesto, an honest ego and a healthy body, an eye to see nature, a heart to feel nature, courage to follow nature, the sense of proportion, humor, appreciation of work as idea and idea as work, fertility of imagination, capacity for faith and rebellion, disregard for commonplace inorganic elegance, instinctive cooperation, then the nursing couple is above all this, this uncommon elegance, instinctive cooperation, idea as work, work as idea. My baby, a sapling, latched to the infrastructure of my leafy breasts, doubles her weight early, tugging at the next month, then we are ready. Six, a US Senator for the first time breastfeeds during a vote. It took a new law to allow this. In 2018, the first senator to give birth while in office. In Iceland, a senator drew international attention for the act, which she thought was ordinary life, not trying to be an icon. You've got to do what you got to do. Seven, there are native women in Alaska who are afraid to nurse. There are toxins in the water, the air, the fish. Taking the land is taking everything, even sometimes the peace to nurse your baby. Yet women are resilient or they need to be. Eight, I wanted to put up a flyer for a breastfeeding support group, but resident services said the rendering of a nursing mother and her baby was inappropriate. The baby devouring the breast, nothing visible but hunger. Places I've pumped, Amtrak bathroom, bathroom at the Holocaust Museum, in tears having seen images of women with their babies in line for the showers, behind a divider in the nurse's office at school, my car while driving, the trunk of my car at a state park, not in a glass office, at a drag show, where a woman beside me was building a puppet stage in a room with other women doing the same thing, while sorting bras, tampons, and maxi pads for women who are homeless. Places I've breastfed, the dentist while they were working on my mouth, in the grass, in a bathroom, in the dark, in the New Orleans heat when the power went out, in a meeting, on the beach, at the mall, in a corner facing the wall, in the heart of a tree which fell into a bench, in the blueberry orchard, pretty much everywhere, while making eggs, while reading a story to my other children, while talking on the phone, while grocery shopping, while reading. Nine. Allen Ginsberg cried out to his mother, Naomi, who had just died. Oh, glorious muse that bore me from the womb, gave suck first mystic life and taught me talk and music. 10, my son, red dye from his snow cone all over his face says, take a picture, mommy, while I'm happy. My baby's neck is always collecting droplets of milk, of fuzz, happiness slushing around. The last poem I'll read just comes out of living in New Orleans with my family for six years and seeing people experience hurricane season in all kinds of ways. Um, a lot of people re-traumatize um, from their Katrina experiences. Every time it rains, a requiem. My daughter would bring home a hurricane that is only wind. Born in New Orleans, she thinks hurricanes will learn the art of conversation even small talk, wind creaking the porch, just sighing along neighborly. Remember when you destroyed a sugar plantation, uprooted cane like a bombed cemetery on the fringes of war? You swept a sunflower seed near the sparrow, knowing it would clench the fatty tear fallen from the face of the tall flower. In the afternoon, you cooled the baby, born in summer, wearing only a diaper and ribbed white socks. Forget the rage that speared pickup trucks into trees or tried to swallow a city whole. 
Once your reins were so tender, I saw a droplet in the shifting wings of the fly on my windshield. When you forget your lithium and become this unmoored, remember how it can't be good for you to talk that fast. You didn't stop when she told God through the hole in the Superdome to leave the baby with the weak old pampers out of it. When a man with autism yelled on his roof for the helicopter and his daughter, who never heard him yell in all her life, cried with her mouth open. When a red pit bull gave birth in the storm and her whole litter drowned. Now, every time it rains, the pink cottage, the white bathroom become a wet manger on AP Turo Street and the dogs circling around cramping, thinking they need her warmth. They'll be there just born. Thank you. It's my privilege to turn it over to my teacher, Michael Collier. Thanks, Hannah and Charlie. Um, it was terrific to hear you again. Uh, just for people who were, were there in the audience, thank you for so much. Thank you so much for coming. I wanted to let you know that um, Charlie and Hannah and I read last night, so uh, we're still kind of uh, energized by that experience, and we were able to do it uh, in a in-person setting. Um, and it it makes me realize that whether it's in person or virtual like this, the coming together. Um, to listen to each other uh, read poetry is, is really important. And um, so we're just really glad you're out there, even though we can't see you. Uh, and we'll be happy to you know, take questions if, if you should have them uh, when, when we're finished. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, teaching both Hannah and Charlie at the University of Maryland. They were both undergraduates and graduate students. So I feel as if I know them really well. And uh, one of the ideas behind us reading together was to have this uh, Maryland experience uh, um, since they, they were born and raised here. And I'm, I'm just so happy that you're, you're doing this and um, it's great to hear your, your poems. I thought I would read a few poems from um, older work since since what I have uh, is a new and selected poems. This is a poem, I hadn't read it for years, but I read it last night because we were reading in Baltimore and it's, it's a Baltimore poem. It's about the Baltimore Aquarium, uh, shortly after it opened. Aquarium. The trigger fish and painted queens add curves to their everlasting circuits to avoid the woman working in the aquarium. Blue scuba tanks striped with yellow lightning bolts, red fins, orange gloves, black skin, transform her into a species jury rigged, though a patch of tan skin between calf and thigh, like the cutaway in a diagram, shows human tendon and muscle flexing as she pedals, wipes the aquarium glass with the cloth or dusts mottled armatures of fake coral with a long boot brush. Behind her mask, her eyes are clear and dry. Behind her mask, her eyes are clear and dry, but ringed with black mascara, larger lighter than our grounded selves who wave to her, she waves to us, spits her mouthpiece out, smiles and pulls a glove off with her teeth, then fits it to the air hose. The glove fills and rises like a blowfish, disturbed to be seen by what we see. Unconsciously, we hold our breath and wait until the woman returns the mouthpiece to her mouth before we exhale letting go the bubbles of our wonder and fear of the world behind glass, which we press against to follow the woman's upward swim as she retrieves the glove that bobs orange and optically fat, a cloud in the aquarium sky. And then uh, 
I think some of my family might be uh, on, I can't really tell, but just in case, I thought I would read a few poems that have to do with uh, a family. I have four uh, wonderful sisters, and one of them uh, was a, um, an Olympic springboard diver and, and won a silver medal in the 1964 Olympics in Tokyo. Um, she was an example, uh, an example of, of what it takes to achieve something uh, really spectacular. And um, so this is a poem about really about her, but it includes the family because the family was always kind of watching her and talking about her diving. It's called The Cave. I think of Plato and the limited technology of his cave, the primitive projection incapable of fast forward or reverse, stop action or slow-mo, and the instant replay that would have allowed him to verify once and for all justice or the good. Such is the way my family did, hour upon hour in the dark, watching films of my sister diving, going over her failures and successes like a school of philosophers, arguing fiercely, pulling her up from the depths of the blue water, feet first, her splash blooming around her hips, then dying out into a calm, flat sheet as her fingertips appeared. Sometimes we kept her suspended in her mimesis of gainer and twist until the projector's lamp burned blue with smoke and the smell of acetate filled the room. Always from the shabby armchairs of our dialectic, we corrected the imperfect attitude of her toes, the tuck of her chin, took her back to the awkward approach or weak hurdle, and everywhere restored the half promise of her form. So that each abstract gesture performed in an instant of falling, revealed the fond liaison of time and movement, the moment held in the air, the illusion of something whole, something true. And though what we saw on the screen would never change, never submit to our arguments, we believed we might see it more clearly and understand that what we judged was a result of poor light or the apparent size of things or the change an element evokes, such as when we allowed her to re-enter the water. And all at once, her body skewed with refraction, an effect we could not save her from, though we hauled her up again and again. And uh, along in that vein, I thought I would read a, a, a grandmother poem. We uh, grew up in Phoenix, Arizona and didn't have any relatives around. They were all in, in the Midwest and they, would, they didn't come out and visit very often, uh, but it, usually it, it was around Easter time. <clears throat> and this is a poem about my, uh, my, my father's mother. Grandmother with mink stole, Sky Harbor Airport, Phoenix, Arizona, 1959. It rode on her shoulders, flayed in its purposes of warmth and glamour. Its head like a small dog's and its eyes more sympathetic than my mother's eyes kindness, which was vast. Four paws for good luck, but also tiny sandbags of mortification and ballast. And in the black claws, a hint of brooch or clasp. Secured like that, the head could loll, and the teeth and the snout's fixed grin was the clenched, oh shit, of roadkill askew in the gutter. This she wore no matter the weather, and always, always when she stepped from the plane and paused at the top of the rolling stairs, she fit her hand to her brow, against the glare of concrete and desert. 
Not a white glove's soft salute, but a visor that brought us into focus. Mother and father waving first, then oldest to youngest, dressed in our Easter best. We were prodded to greet her. She who gripped the hot gleaming rail, set her teeth in the mink's stiff grin and walked through the waterless, smokeless mirage between us. She who wore the pelt, the helmet of blue hair, and came to us mint and camphor scented, more strange than her unvisited world of trees and seasons, offering us two mouths, two sets of lips, two expressions, the large averted one we were meant to kiss, and the other small, pleading that if we had the choice, we might choose. You know, it's one of those poems about being young and terrified of, of, uh, of a grandmother, also just being terrified of someone older. Uh, it's a kind of sensory um, event that you're not quite prepared for as, as, as a kid. Um, I'm going to read a poem that's based on a form called uh, the golden shovel. And a golden shovel is when you take it, it, it was invented by the poet Terrence Hayes, Terrence Hayes um, in homage to uh, Gwendolyn Brooks. And he took a, a line of one of her poems and then used each word in that line um, as the end word of his poem. Now I'll illustrate it, that's a little abstract. So the line I chose uh, of, of um, Gwendolyn Brooks reads this way. And it's the, uh, uh, the last quatrain of the Ballad of Emmett Till. She kisses her killed boy and she is sorry. Uh, so I use that line in this little poem. The background of this poem is that in 1986, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks came to the University of Maryland. She was the, um, uh, I think it was still the poetry consultant, or maybe it was, she was poet laureate. And uh, she was invited out to read at the University of Maryland in the spring. And a colleague of mine had the idea to invite Len Bias, who was finishing up his senior year in his glory, to come to the reading and present her with a bouquet of flowers. Um, Len Bias had to come from the basketball awards banquet that was being that held that night. And so he got there late. Len Bias, a bouquet of flowers and Miss Brooks. He arrives in the middle of her reading. She has to stop and taking the flowers he's brought, kisses the beautiful young man whose yellow socks are her dowdy sweater's antithesis. What said between them is killed by applause, but not his smile, which is the smile of a boy standing in the silence he's created, and not her magnified stare, which says, she understands why he's arrived late, is already leaving and that he is sorry. That event happened in, in 1986 and I didn't write about it until uh, a few years ago. Uh, and, and I think that that happens a lot with poems. Um, it's, uh, these things are waiting for us and the right moment comes. I'd like to read a couple um, of the poems in the news section. This is called A Man of Rueful Countenance. I woke up in the desert, which does not mean I had come to my senses, but found, although I knew how to pray, I had nothing to pray with. I had lived a chivalrous life, opening doors for women and children and men, nodding my head for them to pass, offering my seat wherever I could. 
Although the needle of my vision was true to the path of my calling, staying on track required constant correction and a steady belief in my fellow humans. A man like myself lives by quests, not crusades. And so I tore off the tail of my shirt and tied it in knots to serve as a rosary. If I had been a sinner, a criminal, or the thief of my own soul, I would have made a scourge of my shoes studded with spines and flayed myself all the way to the skull of Golgotha. But my sins have been mild and for that harder to cleanse, except by device and resourcefulness. Like the rosary I worry with my hands, its beads caressed by words from my lips. The sun is hot on my skin. Penance is a circle and circular like faith overlaid on ax. When I get to the end, to the crucifix of matchsticks, I begin again with the glory be, the sorrowful or joyful mysteries. It should be easier to love, more difficult to hate. But looking up, I see the desert is full of people walking in circles, saying the prayers they know how to say. This is a, uh, this is a prose poem. And Charlie, it kind of speaks to your poem about your, your work experience. I think it's called the salvation of America Flagstaff, Arizona, 1972. Gene, our foreman drove a red Ford Ranchero and wore, and wore laundered Western shirts with pearl snap pockets and cuffs, a belt buckle, the size of Montana where he was from and round-toed cowboy boots. He smelled of bay rum and brill cream and waited in his cab for the dust to settle before he'd opened the door. Fuck was his main form of encouragement, and I don't give a shit his answer to everything we said about why the job is off schedule. And then he'd disappear for a while in the trailer where his Mormon bosses, who wore white hard hats, chastened him with their calm, terrifying, alien demeanors. Gene was an employee of Ken Kale Plumbing who fired him. Then the Mormons fired Ken and all of us were let go, including the welders from Lubbock. The rest of us, Ray Borst, John Likovich, a squirrely acne-faced guy whose name I don't remember, but who had dreams of becoming a classical guitarist, and Michael Collier. Whenever I hear someone say, we need businesses and corporations to solve America's problems, I see, standing, I see us standing in the deep, wide ditch, blasted out of solid rock, meant to carry water, gas, and sewer lines, looking up at Gene, Ken, and the Mormons with their sick, despairing, hopeless, not really knowing what the fuck to do expressions, except to have the four of us, teenagers, pre-apprentice plumbers with long stringy hair, each with the shovel, keep spreading popcorn size volcanic cinders, wheelbarrowed from dump truck loads, to cushion the pipe, hoping, but not having a clue, that when the ditch was filled, the lines would bear the weight. This is called uh, pen relays, and the pen relays are, are still held um, every spring at the University of, of Pennsylvania. They're not as big a deal as they used to be, but pen relays. My father is searching his wrist, 
patting with fingers at moments before, nervously fiddled the bed sheets hem. Those of us near him see in his fidget a body reading the braille of his dying. But all my father wants is his wristwatch, the one with pen relays running around the face of the clock. It would give him some comfort to wear, not that he knows where he is, not that he cares about time, but he's never not had it awake strapped to his wrist, not since he and his teammates won what's engraved on the back. Half Mile Relay Championship of America, 1937. And then I have um, uh, two more poems. This is called Poem for uh, a 60th Birthday. When I see you coming up the drive, broad striped headband covering your hair and ears, your legs solid, tan from a million miles of walking. When I see your arms swinging at your sides, hands loose at mid thigh, a t-shirt appearing to be clothes pinned to your shoulders, and maybe hear your shoes scruff and drag, or maybe hear you stop to look back from where you'd been to check again the view of fields and river you love more deeply than I. And when I hear you talking to the barn cat who trots to greet you like a cat acting like a dog, or maybe you've stopped to pull weeds, restake a toppling hollyhock, then I know that forgetting, as if you'd never been away, had been crucial to seeing in your absence how much I missed you. And then I'll end with uh, this poem called Tree Beyond Your Window. One day you look up, and all that's left of leaves is a twisted trunk, thick at the base, an obelisk split at the top like an ungulant's hoof, a shaft riddled with holes, hopeful places for birds to make their fastidious nests. And if you look closer, you'll see a tortoise, head as big as a howitzer shell, and two legs trying calmly to swim out from the leathery bark of which it's made. It wants to know, like an accuser in a dream, what have you done with your life? And raising its rough amphibious hands, holding them out, implores you to pull its ancient body from the tree. So um, thanks very much. And Hannah and Charlie, great, as I said, to be with you. Really wonderful. And thanks, Politics and Prose, for you know, putting this together and, and hanging in with us um, so that it could be a, a virtual event. Yes, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you to all of you. Um, we have 10 minutes. Um, so hopefully enough time to maybe get through one or two questions, but I'm never upset if that means hearing more poems. Um, one of the questions that started out um, at the beginning of the reading, I think we're all in agreement that we just really love the ability to hear poems out loud right now. Um, so I'm going to combine some questions from the Q&A and ask you all about your writing process. How much of that is hearing your poems out loud as you're writing? Um, that's good for anyone who'd like to start off. Well, I can, I can jump in and say, yeah, I, I, I often, the, my, my writing process is that I sort of, I, as I'm reading or as I'm doing anything, I'll find words that I find interesting and sort of start compiling lists of them. Um, or images or whatever it is, and eventually sort of pull them together um, and sort of see what I have. Um, but once it gets to a point where there's actual like 
syntax going on, you know, it's important for me to hear it out loud. So there's a lot of, you know, me typing and saying things kind of under my breath, thinking, no, 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 blah, 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 blah. So, you know, there's the, the, the audible component, even though, you know, I think most of the time my poems are, when people read them, they're not reading them aloud to themselves necessarily, or I don't know. But, um, you know, for the most part, I, I think of them as being experienced in, in silence um, by readers. Um, yeah, it's crucial that, that they make sense in the mouth, I think, yeah. I can say something on that question. I usually do read poems out loud as part of my revision process, but I still feel like my writing process is like kind of silent and and nervous and afraid, I think. And then um, I usually also have like a workshop friend or two that I'll um, meet with normally, but meet with over Zoom now. And I'll read the poem and then my friend will read the poem. And that helps like, I think with editing or catch things that don't work or don't make sense or things that don't sound good together. So it's definitely part of uh, revision and writing process. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree with all that. The, you know, it's um, uh, poetry and language, it's a, it's a physical experience, it's visceral and it comes from inside of us. Uh, so I think it's absolutely important that you're reading at almost every stage, you know, even the first line, you're reading aloud. And um, uh, otherwise you don't, you don't get that pleasure of what it's like in your body and you, you don't get a kind of um, resonance and um, a synthesis of emotion mm. and, um, and really music. So yeah, I think it's crucial to be reading aloud. And I mean, I loved the three days. It was wonderful. Um, so thank you all for sharing your process and for your reading. Um, let's see. With the interest of time, there's a question I really wanted to ask. Um, Michael, you kind of alluded to it in saying that you're um, reading from your new and selected. And Hannah and Charlie, you're both reading from your debut collection. Um, what is that like? What's the difference in putting together um, your first collection and what's going to go in that book versus coming back to your previous works and adding a new poem to that book, Michael? Um, and again, whoever would like to go first. Well, I'll say something simple about uh, a complex process uh, of, of trying to, you know, choose from uh, seven books of poems. And, and that is like, it was, it, it was a, a large process of revision. It, it was like revising uh, down, it, not really uh, narrowing. I didn't think of it that way, but kind of, well, how would you revise your sense of, of who you are, if, mm. uh, who you became over the years? It, not as a person, but in the work, you know, this voice, um, how did your style develop? Um, and so that's how I, that's how I began to, th to think about it. And, and then also at one point I just realized, you, you know, there's things that are just going to left be left, have to be left out. And so give it up. Don't, don't worry about it. You always have, I always have a relationship to that poem. And, uh, and that made it a little less, a little less, Painless. What about for you, um, Hannah and Charlie? Were things left out that harder to make that choice for a first book? Do you want to go first, Hannah? Um, sure, I'll go. <laughs> Um, so my first book was had a really long gestation period of like over 10 years. So I have a lot of poems, um, but trying to like find a book in the poems uh, took some time and some like my editor, Gerald Ma, helped quite a bit in trying to sort of 
figure out like what is this book's obsession and what obsessions fit and what are Mm. not that they're bad poems but they just don't belong in this book so I think motherhood kind of drives this and kind of coming of age and hysteria and some other like archives that kind of made it a sort of section of the book so kind of like finding the core and and what fits in not that everything's neat in the book by any means but um but I'm okay with stuff not making it um Yeah, it's definitely a process of things not making it in. Um, Similar to what Hannah said, this book was very long in coming. And there was a point when I thought of it as sort of a ship of Theseus where I've I've had manuscripts, so many different manuscripts going and replacing so many planks and things that, uh, you know, how I arrived at this at this final uh, collection of poems is, is a little bit of a mystery, but I think that they were the poems that I had been writing over the last 12, 15 years that, that stayed with me the longest and that I found consistent joy in. Um, and, and that I think kind of became a, became a, a motivating factor. Like, does this give me pleasure still, even though it's 10 years old or six years old? Um, and uh, yeah, and, and that, that wound up sort of being the, the, the driving factor, I guess, for me. Hey, thank you all so much for if sharing I, some topics. Yeah, sorry. If you can jump in real quickly. Um, so uh, Hannah and, and Charlie have been working on these books for a, a really long time, but you, you heard what they said was they kept, they didn't get stuck thinking, oh, I've finished a book and I'm gonna start another book they sort of understood that the first book, you know, it, it comes out of the continual process of, of, of writing and distillation until, you know, someone publishes it. And I think a lot of times uh, young writers get hung up on, on the idea that, oh, I finished this book. Now I go on and write another book. And um, it's, they're really good case examples and also tenacity and passion. Um, and you know, uh, belief in in themselves, even though they doubted quite often if it would ever get published. But here they are, and they're wonderful books. They are, and they are for sale at, um, at on our website. You'll see links in our Zoom chat for purchase of. I only have two of them in front of me. Um, Michael's book and Hannah's book and Charlie's book are available for purchase and store on our website. Um, let's see. I'd love to ask this one last question. We may not have full time for it. So in light of the pandemic, a lot of people are saying that they finally get to read more or they're writing more. Have you all been reading anything interesting lately that you'd like to share? As we are a bookstore. I just finished a, a fantastic book that was written in the late 60s called The Peregrine by J.A. Baker. And it's, it's about his obsession with uh, Peregrine. And it was um, recommended to me by Maud Casey. Um, I, I don't want to say too much about it, but the identification between uh, Baker uh, the identification that Baker has with these creatures is is just well he describes it I can't I can't do another description of it but it's it's a beautiful example of how and there's some misanthropic aspects to it about not you know liking humans for what they're doing to nature um, but the identification he has with the with the hawks is just so powerful I, so that's a book I'd recommend I just reread Toni Morrison's Sula for the third or fourth time and just love it so much. Um, it's kind of like about female friendship and like pariahs and outlaw women. It's really, really good. Um, a lot of people probably already know about it. Um, and Robin Cost Lewis is the voyage of the Sable Venus I read at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, yeah. I, um, there are certain books that I'm sort of always reading, but one, one thing that I, um, found recently that I have uh, that I really enjoyed is a book uh, by a younger poet named Maya Phillips. It's called Eru, E-R-O-U, um, and it's sort of it's 
not it's a, it's kind of a project book like a book length sequence but loosely um pairing the death of her father with uh the story of the odyssey um and it's really it's just an incredibly well-written book in the way that she sort of navigates around that uh subject and all the things that it comes to touch in her life um is is really fantastic i've also um I started reading uh, the Voronish notebook by Ashup Mendelstam. Um, it's poems that he had been writing when he was exiled in, in Voronish in, in Russia. And it's, it's just unbelievable. You know, it's the sort of book where I, I've been reading it so slowly. I, I read like, there are lots of very short poems, you know, like read a single page and have to put it down for 10 minutes and think, oh my God, how did, how did he manage to do this? Um, so yeah, those are the, the two things that have, have really opened it up for me a lot in, in, in the pandemic. All right, well, we're at time. Thank you again to Michael, Hannah, and Charlie for reading your poems, telling us a little bit about your process and what you're reading right now. And all the books are available for purchase on our website. Please see the links in our chat. And catch us next time on another PNP Live. Thanks so much, Aisha. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Michael and Hannah. Thank you, Michael. See you guys. Uh, have good travels back.